May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. My mother lived until she was just one month short of a hundred. One of the things I remember most about her was her saying, thank you. The nurses who called to see her, those who cared for her in hospital, the doctor who visited, the man next door who came to do her shopping, again and again she would say, thank you. Now Luke tells this story of human misery and suffering on the road to Jerusalem. And these men approach Jesus and they say, Lord, have mercy. The story says that they, Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. And so this morning, as we meet to worship, we give thanks for all that the Bible means by salvation, freedom from boredom, vitality, joy, hope, courage, all those things. But you won't get there by sitting down and dreaming and working out theories, not even by staying on your knees and praying indefinitely. It comes along the road to obedience. And maybe that's God's word for us today. Plain, unspectacular obedience. Now let's suppose that we've been told that story for the first time and someone says, finish it. Well, how would you finish it? As it dawns upon the men that they have been healed, and let's think what that means, because to have leprosy was to be unclean, was to be cut off from social contact, was to be treated as less than human, was to lose your dignity. How would you finish the story? We are healed. Jesus of Nazareth has done it. We must hurry back to thank him. Blessed be the Lord of God, God of Israel, for he has visited us and they hurried back to say thank you. It doesn't end that way, does it? Only one returns and we hear nothing more of the other nine. And that seems to be a shocking commentary on human nature. Shocking ingratitude, bad manners. And the question I ask is, is that typical or untypical? Well, I do know that more often we are inclined to say, to ask for things and to say thank you. And that so often we can be ungrateful. Just think of the heaped up blessings of every day. And so the psalmist could say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. A song of thanks to a God who gives generously, more than we can ask or think. And so today, just for a moment, particularly as we are in lockdown, it's a good chance for us to remember those ordinary, everyday things we so often take for granted. The world in which we live, our life, our food, our shelter, the love and the joy and the hope, memory, day, night, summer, winter, Mercy's new every morning. And later in this service, we shall remember to give thanks for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Robert Louis Stevenson, the author, was not put off by the blood on his handkerchief when he coughed because he had tuberculosis but he said, that is not going to snuff out my life. I will continue to give thanks for God. And what about those special occasions? I'm sure we've all had them. Decisions to be made, crises to be faced, illness to recover from. And the Old, prophet, Old Testament prophet said again and again, 
to the people, you forgot God. What about the stupendous facts of the gospel? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The mighty acts of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, do we accept them in a dull and mechanical way? Or can we go along with the hymnist and say, lost in wonder, love and praise? So I ask the question, are the nine so different? Different from the rest of us? Why don't we say thank you? Well, we could say we deserve this. It's our entitlement. If there's a God, he shouldn't have allowed us to suffer in the first place. He's taken his time bringing justice to us. Why should I say thank you? Have you ever, and I certainly I have, have you ever talked about your rights when you're really talking about things you enjoy because of the sheer grace of God, undeserved, unearned, unmerited? Or perhaps other things were more urgent, urgent so Jesus could wait. For these men had lots to do now. They had to get a health clearance, start looking for a job, re-establish themselves in society. Jesus can wait until we've done that. And that rings a bell for me because so often we don't mean to be ungrateful. We're just preoccupied. There's so much to do. Life's so busy and Jesus can wait. They're very poignant words, aren't they? Weren't ten made clean? Where are the other nine? Or as we move into the story of the, in the Gospels, we find Jesus weeping and saying over the city, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens and you didn't? Jesus can wait. But one of them felt differently. The priests can wait, their friends can wait, the job can wait, society can wait, but not Jesus, and he goes back to say thank you. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, he fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. Bit demonstrative, trifle vulgar, bit embarrassing, but that's our loss, not his. Why should he not glorify God? The most important thing in his life had happened. And as one of the divines said quite quaintly, if God saves me, he'll never hear the end of it. But then there's just this little phrase that slips in there. One of them came back and he was a Samaritan. Well, perhaps the other nine were glad to get rid of him. He was a foreigner, a half-breed. And it's remarkable how the most unlikely people responded to Jesus and even Jesus' comments about this stranger. Matthew, Zacchaeus, traitors to their nation by serving the Romans. Jesus anointed by a prostitute. A handful of rough fishermen not very distinguished. These became the nucleus of his church. And from a Roman centurion, an intruder, there to uphold the authority of an unwelcome invader, Jesus said, I haven't found faith like this anywhere in Israel. The art of saying thank you. This one man's devotion made Jesus happy. For him, the world could be a lonely place, critical, cold, hostile. And this story is told in the context of a gathering storm as the authorities worked out ways to get rid of him and for him to meet with gratitude was to receive strength. 
Of course, Jesus was full of thanksgiving. The most remarkable statement, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he took wine and said, thank you. Knowing full well what was ahead, he said, thank you. Well, it may be difficult to understand, but our bumbling words of devotion, our broken, tarnished loyalty can cheer the heart of Jesus and make a difference. As we move into the story of the Passion, we read that an angel strengthened him. We read that Jesus chose 12 to be with him. And at the end of his life, as he faced an awful week of rejection and betrayal, injustice, cruelty, suffering and death, there was a home at Bethany that welcomed him. And Peter, James and John in the garden and a black man who carried his cross and a dying thief who was promised admission to a paradise. All these can become God's reinforcing messengers. And so the word today is, what can we do for Jesus who has done so much for us? As we come to this table of remembrance, we give thanks. Amen.